a lecture on Albert R. And his family thinks I'm too objective. I don't agree that Amos was a crazy old man in his years out of the church. And they've never been here in the three times that I've spoken on this book, which is heresy to some, objective. And even if you talk to Mormon authorities, they'll say, hey, the guy's done his homework and uh, can back up what he says. And what I say about the San Juan, and I honored Albert R. I, I drove third of the landing to hear him speak and to Escalante back when I was a young returned missionary. Amos Lyman had a sad end of his life. After being a heroic advocate of the church virtually all his life and almost constantly serving on a mission. He faded from the limelight in one sense. Now my talk today is on the early years before he's in the limelight. And there are a whole lot of linemen in Connecticut. I had a rival wrestling coach who went to one of those linemen family reunions in Connecticut that we haven't had much association with, but should, because it's huge and it's important they are among the founders of Connecticut. Amos's family was across the Connecticut River, New Hampshire. He was a descendant of Elias, his grandfather, who with probably brothers and cousins, there were 11 of them helping settle a township or a town of Lyman, New Hampshire. Not the county, the township. Amos's father was one of the last of those Lymans in the township. But he married a lady whose last name was Mason, whose father had been given a plot of land as a Revolutionary War veteran. Perez Mason and his daughter married Elias Lyman's son, Roswell. And Amasa was born on Grandfather Perez's ranch farm where I have made a pilgrimage and enjoyed that area very much. When Amasa, who had an older brother and a younger brother and a younger sister Ruth, was only a year and a half old, his dad went looking for his brother who had gone to upstate New York and hadn't been heard from. And Amos's father wasn't heard from more than a couple of letters, more to his mother than to his wife, which has never seemed quite kosher to me. And then, according to rumors, he was killed in New Orleans, but we don't know. All we know is that Amos's mom, after a couple years, remarried. And Mr. Emerson was not welcoming those other children with open arms. 
Amos's older brother was was sort of uh, put off in a family that didn't treat him like a son. Amos has stayed with Grandpa Perez Mason. The younger son, brother, and sister went with the mother and Emerson. Amos didn't seem to have much to do with Emerson. He did visit his mother several times later in his life. Grandpa and Grandma Mason died within two years. Now, Perez was the only father he ever knew. Perez's son was a straight-laced Puritan deacon. And even as a kid, Amasa didn't quite fit with that Calvinist salvation by grace doctrine. Perez was a universalist that all men would be saved and that Christ had something to do with that, but it wasn't very direct. And some people later accused Amasa of sort of embracing some of that, which I don't see, but it is a possibility. Both grandparents died within two years, and Uncle Parley Mason was in custody of Amasa. And Amasa obviously went to the Congregationalist Puritan Church, but never fully embraced it. He had three cousins, Parley's sons, whom he was cordial with, but they weren't really close. He visited one of those who became a clergyman on his way back from his European mission in 1862. In fact, that family received one of Amos's mission photos that was passed on to me after that. And I had those available for people in the reunions the last two times we were here, but I forgot to bring them this time. But I have a beardless photograph of him that some of you haven't seen that came through that Mason family, which he stayed in touch with, not as close as he stayed with Ruth. I think the younger brother must have died young. He didn't stay in touch with the older brother, but he did write to Ruth in his later years. Early in the church history, 1831-32, a lot of missionaries were being sent out, including Lyman Johnson and Orson Pratt, into the New Hampshire, Connecticut area. And Uncle Parley told Amos to stay away from them, and he didn't do it. Met them on the road, met them in the woods, embraced their teachings, and was baptized. And Amos had never said, was evicted from the home, but him joining the LDS church would have been a great embarrassment to Deacon Mason. And it wasn't more than a week or so before he packed his few clothing in a bundle, took $12, and started down the Connecticut River. When he ran out of money, stopped, in the Palmyra, New York area and earned enough money to take some kind of a steam transport across the Erie, Lake Erie, into the Kirtland, Ohio area. Lyman Johnson's parents lived in Hiram, near Kirtland. In fact, in your Doctrine and Covenants, there's a photograph of their inn, their home, in which Joseph Smith had the revelation, the vision, section 76. So you can see where Amasa lived in his first months in the church in Ohio. At that time, Joseph was in Missouri, but when he came back after about 10 weeks, they met. And Amasa recorded that. And some of you have read it, maybe even in the obscenely thick book. <laughs> One book reviewer said it's too heavy. And it is. I made a deal. 
if they wouldn't cut anything out, I wouldn't ask for any of their money. <laughs> and uh, they did that once, but they wouldn't do it twice. The University of Utah wanted to cut my next book, and so I took it back from them. And it's coming out at the end of this year, and it's 700 pages. It's, it's just as heavy as this one. When Amasa met Joseph, he made a memorable statement. He said, as I grasped hands, I felt as one of old in the presence of the Lord. My strength was gone. There was no fear. It was serenity and peace. The voice of the Spirit in the depth of my soul ever remained with the testimony that Joseph was a man of God. And Joseph remained faithful to Joseph his whole life. Maybe not to Brigham. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, and that's where some of the philosophical conflict with that honored Albert Robinson Lyman, Robinson Lyman comes. Amasa was soon called on a mission, mostly to upstate New York, Joseph Smith's home area, after Vermont. Um, missionary work was a lot different in those early days. They uh, didn't have pamphlets. They didn't use the Book of Mormon much yet. There wasn't really a coordinated message. It's amazing how much each set of missionaries was on their own. In fact, Emma's diary makes it very clear that he became a troubleshooter. And later he gave conference talks where he said, I spent most of my time undoing some he didn't say screw-ups <laughs> that other missionaries had, had caused. But the church was maturing. In the middle of that, Missouri was determined by revelation to be the gathering place for Zion. And you've got two centers of the church, one in Ohio and one in Missouri. And when the Missouri saints had trouble, Joseph called a Zion's camp to go rescue them. They changed their mind through revelation before any serious conflict. Amasa and some of the other single men stayed out there for a while. He encountered the Partridge family and must have had an excellent relationship with Edward Partridge, <laughs> one of the leaders of the church out there. And Dad must have told the daughters, this is a pretty impressive guy. There were actually four Partridge women sealed to Joseph. Harriet died just before she probably... Lyman, do you agree? Maybe she was courting him when she died. I don't know. I don't think so. But she was sealed to him yes. right after her death. Yeah. And the other three didn't stay with him when he was no longer considered as faithful, but... A lot of us are related to those three partridge women. After he did come back to Ohio, he re-met a New York girl that he had known earlier on his mission from Bolton, New York, Mariah, Loiza, and sometimes it's Loiza Mariah, Tanner, whom he married. And boy, did he inherit some great brothers-in-law. They carried him through most of his history in the West. But he's still more on a mission than he is living with his wife. And one of his most interesting missions is back in that upstate New York area, which the greatest scholar of 
evangelical religion, a guy named Whitney Cross, called the Burned Over District. Revival after revival. And even in that book, in the details and in the footnotes, Whitney Cross talks about how much trouble the Calvinists are having, the Puritans, losing parishioners to Mormon missionaries. It's right where Amasa is right at that time when Cross's documents are complaining about how successful the Mormons are in converting Puritans away from Calvinism to faith including works. We doing all right with the... Yeah, I just want to adjust a little bit. Maybe I just need to stand still better. I think you're okay. Emerson was a, an impressive missionary and uh, would run into converts and ask them to help him in dozens of ways the rest of his life. It wasn't long before the whole church moves back to Missouri. And that's a tough part of church history, isn't it? And Amasa grows as a leader back there. In fact, he uh, is in jail several times, suffers horribly with malaria. His health was horrible. And one of the things that just makes me in awe of him is how much he gets done when his health is so terrible or when he's in so much pain. In Missouri, after a bout of malaria, he serves as a spy. <coughs> Going into a town that has some Mormons, to try and help them get out. They've actually left. And he's captured with a guy named Dunn. And they uh, miraculously are released four days later. He's a spy again during a literal war between two militia units. One that's Mormon and one that's Missouri. Both commanded by Boggs. I mean, he gave them their commissions. Amasa had a commission from Lilliburn Boggs. There are deaths on both sides in that Battle of Crooked River. Amos is not in it. He learns about it through inspiration from a little further away, tells his companions that there's been a battle. I don't know whether he was very effective as a spy, but he... Um, he soon emerged as something of a known Mormon leader, and as such, he's arrested with a group that includes Joseph and Sidney Rigdon and Lyman White and George Robinson, Alexander McKay, Hiram Smith, and they're to be shot that evening. But the militia general, Donovan, won't do it. And he remains a hero to LDS, even in the Mormon battalion time. They're taken to Independence about 35 miles away after having five minutes to tell their families goodbye in far west, the Mormon town, after they've been driven out of Zion in Independence County. In independence, they're exhibited in the street as trophies of war. They're imprisoned. You've heard of Richmond Jail. As near as I can tell, it's a run-down log cabin, but they've got leg irons, chains. In fact, both Emma and Joseph recall later in their lives being chained together at Richmond. That's the time that Parley P. Pratt remembers 
Joseph standing up in the night rebuking the guards for boasting about the horrible things they have done to Mormon, including Mormon women, during their escapades through the week. And as you may remember, Parley said silence. He commanded them, as ye fiends of the infernal pit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you and command you to be still. I will not live another minute and hear such language from you. Amasa heard that. He didn't record it. Harley P. Pratt did. The guards apologized. In court soon after that, the same General Donovan, an attorney, defended some of these accused and got them released including Emerson. <coughs> Joseph went on to Liberty Jail, where he was for quite a long time. Emerson was soon pursued again. This time, he's got a swollen, lame arm. He doesn't live in the town. He's trying to make his way home, but goes back in the town to a home that he has a friend Theodore Turley, but nobody's home with the 10-year-old girl, Priscilla. He finally convinces her to let him in, that he's being pursued and that they'll kill him if he doesn't hide. She courageously lets him in, hides him in a little compartment near the attic, puts the ladder back, and straight-faced lies to the, the mob that comes that nobody else is in there. She hasn't seen anybody else. Why would anybody want to come into a house with just a little 10-year-old girl there? She convinced him and saved his life. Later, when the dad offers Amasa a plural wife from among his daughters, he chooses Priscilla, who's probably 16 or 17 then, later in the Nauvoo period, and they are married. And she stays with him the whole time, and uh, is a faithful wife and loves to dance. Emerson sometimes babysits while she goes with the older kids to the dance. When she was 70 years old, she broke her leg dancing down in California. She never did get healed before she died. Emerson knew had sensitivity toward wives and their needs, although plural marriage would not make that easy. Um, Amasa was quite instrumental in helping people evacuate from Missouri when they realized they could no longer survive there in 1838. Uh, he was in hiding, so he couldn't take as visible a place as Theodore Turley or Brigham Young or Heber C. Kimball. They all helped. Turley was actually a justice of the peace, so he could help a little bit more. In fact, he helped sell Joseph Smith's parents' land. And instead of moving further west from Missouri, they go back across the Mississippi River to Quincy, Illinois. Sometimes you can follow their trail by the blood on the snow. It's one of the toughest times the church ever had and it's hard to measure people meaner to other people than the Missourians were to these people. Lyman was a justice of the peace in Missouri too. He helped with some of this legal transfer of land. Even after his family had been taken to Missouri, he came back and helped. He tried to spring Parley P. Pratt out of jail back in Missouri. Most did finally get out, were well treated in the Quincy, Illinois area. Lyman and the Tanners located some land across the Mississippi in Montrose, Iowa area. And uh, owned, Amasa owned a farm. He never did much farming, but he owned a farm there that year, although he was ill with that malaria a lot of the time as were some of the others. Joseph finally gets out of jail, but the Missourians will 
harass him all the time he's in Illinois. In fact, in the Jones Smith papers, there'll be a whole volume in that published set of history just on his time in court fighting off the Missourians. And there's a great Amos Lyman story related to that that I'll tell in one of the other sessions. It doesn't, doesn't fit here. It's just before his really active Nauvoo career begins. But the powers that be that set up my chronology for what I have to say put that in one of the other sessions rather than here. But it's one of the great stories where Amos's sermon convinces the judge that Joseph's not guilty, lets him go when the Missourians want to take him back and put him on trial. Great story that you can find in George Q. Cannon's History of Joseph Smith. Amos, uh, while he's in Il oh, Iowa, Joseph receives a revelation that fills in details on the Melchizedek priesthood. And Joseph calls his brother, Don Carlos Smith, to be the head of that high priest group through the region, and Amos is one of his counselors. In that role, he is sent around Iowa among church groups, uh, including new stakes, to train stake leaders in these new aspects of organization and practice. Two of the people he associates with are Lyman White, Bishop Lyman White, and he will be mentioned in section 24, Joseph's Revelation at that time, as will George Miller. Actually, Lyman White's later an apostle. George Miller's the bishop. After a year in Iowa, Joseph directs Amos and his family to move to Nauvoo, where his first job is working in Turley's gunsmith shop. He loved that metalwork. He actually constructed a very intricate measuring device in metal that was passed down in the family several generations. I, has anybody heard of where that is? I don't think we know where it is anymore. But Amasa didn't have a whole lot of jobs. He was mostly a missionary, but that was one that he really liked and uh, that he would have stayed with had he not been so busy with church, church work. I'm going to tell that story anyway about <laughs> court. Joseph is talking to a chicken governor of Illinois when a Missouri officer comes with a writ for Joseph's arrest and the governor, Carlin, lets him do it. And so the Missourian and all of them take Joseph to jail. The judge is Stephen A. Douglas, Lincoln's rival in Illinois later on. And his court is about 50 miles north in Monmouth, Illinois. And Joseph goes to jail there. And there are about two dozen LDS priesthood brethren who accompany him, sort of to watch and maybe protect a little bit. He's safe in the jail. In fact, it's upstairs. He can't come down to eat. They have to take the food up to him. And one of the problems is he's promised to appear in handcuffs. People want to see him. He's going to get a chance to talk to him. And the sheriff won't let him appear in that dangerous situation. So he designates Amasa, one of these rookie priesthood brethren, to represent him presenting a gospel message to this group that has come to hear Joseph. And Amasa does well with it. 
he uh, delivers a discourse to a large crowd in the courtroom downstairs. And George Q. Cannon, who's a, a new newspaper reporter from the Isle of Man, John Taylor's nephew, reporting for John Taylor's Nauvoo newspaper. And Cannon describes Amos's talk as filled with power and spirit and says there was a total revulsion of sentiment. The accusations by the Missourians is rejected, reacted against. And when the prisoner arrives in court, Joseph, next day, few demonstrated any sympathy for him staying in jail. In fact, Cannon says this in that book, about Joseph Smith. Amazon had helped soothe public opinion and sway it in Joseph's favor. Even Joseph's history, the documentary history of the church, says in volume four, page 369, that when he appeared before Douglas, Judge Douglas, next day, Douglas declared the writ, the arrest warrant, no longer valid and freed Joseph. Very few people have ever heard that story, and it's uh, an impressive example. In fact, Joseph says in that, in that documentary history that it was about the first principles of the gospel, but it was persuasive enough not to convert the judge, but to change the opinion of him and the audience enough that they approve him being free. Joseph and Amasa will be close. Not as close as Joseph is to his brothers, but in 50 years of studying, I've not seen any other non-family that were closer to Joseph Smith than Amasa Lyman was. And uh, one of the evidences of that that I won't go into now is when Joseph, Joseph's dead and they hold a meeting about who's going to be the next leader. And Sidney Rigdon makes claims. Brigham Young's president of the Quorum of the Twelve, and he's conducting this meeting. The third person besides Brigham and Sidney that speaks is Amazon, because he's a counselor to Joseph in the First Presidency. Not sustained, but recognized. And he puts all of his argument in favor of the Council of the Twelve that he's not even in. And they're my book mentioned several times when he convinces other apostles to back Brigham Young as the president of the church and create a new first presidency, which people haven't discussed very much, but is a very crucial story. And especially when supposedly Amasa and Brigham become alienated from each other, which obviously they did some, It's interesting that Amasa, in two occasions, the other one is after the Vanguard Company goes to Great Salt Lake Valley in the summer of 1847, that winter, at winter quarters and council bluffs, they have a series of meetings and organize a first presidency. And Amasa persuades other apostles to back that. And the way I read it, they wouldn't have if it hadn't been for his influence. He's very persuasive. If people don't know that he was the most popular preacher in the church at that time. You've never heard that, have you? The guy that says it is B.H. Roberts, who was the most eloquent preacher in the next generation. And probably is our most accepted for those years, 
most accepted and trusted church historian, didn't he? He said it. Why doesn't our family know it? Because uh, of that word apostate. Without the question mark. The book has the question mark all over it. I don't believe it. There's certainly no hint of it in these early years that were what we were supposed to talk about today. Early Amasa Mason Lyman history. I blew it. I mixed that talk up with the eight, the 631. Now I've got to apologize and talk a little bit about his later years. I am sorry. I keep telling my wife that I'm getting seen on. She says, no, you're not. Here's proof. Leo, let's just finish the talk and just switch the topic in the I can do that. I agree. I can do that. It's inspiration. Let's go back and see if there's some questions on these early years. I love his time in Connecticut. I'd love to talk about that more. It's not a happy period. New Hampshire, Connecticut. Any questions about back in Lyman, New Hampshire? There's a whole book on that. The Lyman's back there. How about, yes? When did his health issues start? When health issues start, I think in Missouri. Okay. We don't know much about malaria, but he had it and it recurred many times in his life. As near as I can tell, he never had any real medicine for it. But I know that he spends weeks debilitated. And sometimes he's, he's performing church service when most people wouldn't get out of bed. You can see that easy when you've read through the lines as long as I have. What about the Missouri period? Independence or any of that? Question yes. Right okay. Well, Albert. No, I'm just adding on to that malaria thing. In the letters that he wrote to uh, Helena, many times he would get about halfway through and he said his headache was so severe he couldn't even hold a pen. You know? That's right. So he had these incredible migraine headaches every now and then, which perhaps is connected to uh, malaria. I don't know. And he didn't complain, hardly ever. All right. All right. Polina was a great midwife. But she also tended Cornelia through five years of illness that finally ended leaving two young sons for Polina to raise. Partly. Henry and Lorenzo Snowline. And Amasa is so sick in Salt Lake, he can't even come visit them in Paraguay. And his letters to Polina, frankly his favorite wife, but he doesn't show the favoritism except you can read between the lines in his writings a little bit. And he's very fair to all of them, but he's grateful for her compassion to her sister wife. Yes. Have you had a chance to read his journal yet? It was recently published. I helped edit it. You did? Okay. That Scott Partridge died before it was over. Well, exactly. But what I was going to say was about Paulina. Is that how you pronounce it? Paulina? Pliny. Pliny, okay. Paulina. Yeah, he wrote to her more than just about anybody else. He visited her. He's yes. in Perwin more than his share of the time. Received a letter from Paulina. Next day, wrote a letter to Paulina. And what a tragic life she had. She had a son that would have looked a lot like Emerson. He's only five foot nine, but he's 200 pounds when he leaves home. His son, who is taking a, a gun out of the back of the wagon, shoots himself in the stomach, dies in agony. And he may have been six feet, but he was only 16 or so. And what a loss. Amasa mourned him the rest of his life. And Polina lost another son, Oscar, later in a, a boiler explosion in a sawmill up the canyon from Peru. And Polina went up there and saw his mutilated body before it was even 
taken away from the scene. Amasa didn't even get to that funeral. He got to the son Roswell's funeral, but not, not to the, the one that died in the sawmill uh, explosion. Who warned the other guys to get away? Yes. Yeah, Revolutionary War. Did he serve with uh, Francis Marion? I don't think so. Francis Marion was mostly in the South. Yeah. And Perez would be up in the New England or New York area. Okay. Amasa must have fondly admired Francis Marion to name a son after him. Right, that's what I was wondering what that connection was. And then the, the, the Amasa knew Revolutionary War history really well. He probably spent too much time reading history, not enough time reading scriptures. Mm -hmm. So did, did uh, his grandfather on the <clears throat> side, was he in the revolutionary? I don't think he was. Okay. I don't think. Hazel Lyman. I actually the, who, he was. One of the Richards was? Aza with his three sons. Okay. Four of them then, huh? Yeah. And probably a lot more of the Connecticut ones. Because they were really the founders of some parts of Connecticut. And we ought to be more connected to that family. Not just the Mormon branch of the family. Other questions on Missouri or the early period? Yes? Will you talk just a few minutes about the Civil War and how it plays itself with Amazon? Because to me the Civil War had a lot to do with what was going on. Emerson was on his mission in England when it started. But he was an astute reader of newspapers. Not as much as Lori Hefner says. She says he's a man of leisure in, in his British mission and has time to flirt with all of the liberal thought. I don't see that. I see him exhausted every week. I see him preaching ten times a week sometimes. And he's long-winded. Those are short speeches. Uh, he comes back, and when he visits the Masons, he visits relatives that have been wounded. He watches carefully. Brigham Young didn't like Abraham Lincoln. But Amasa did, and sympathized with the Union. When Lincoln died, and that's as the Civil War ends a week later or so, Amasa gives a sermon in the tabernacle honoring Abraham Lincoln. It's non-denominational. The other speaker is a Protestant minister. Brigham doesn't attend it. But it's widely quoted as a very eloquent speech that shows Amasa knows a lot about the issues. I don't think his diary from England reflects much about battles and I don't at this moment know much about any direct involvement except that there was a guy named Stuart who was the champion cradler wheat harvester in San Bernardino he was actually Frederick T. Paris's stepfather who went back and joined his Illinois or whatever state unit during the Civil War and died at Andersonville. He was the most able-bodied farmer in San Bernardino who died in a Union prison camp. And Amasa knew him intimately and would have sympathized with all of that. A horrible way to die. But I don't know any more about that. I know a lot about the Civil War, but not Amasa in it. It's before, before there's much, there's already rivalry in South Carolina. No question about that. Amasa is much loved by the Mississippi Saints, which is from all over the South. They've gathered in Tom Bickby count, or Township, Mississippi. And before the Civil War, it's actually the winter that the First Presidency is organized 
that's the very end of 1847, Amasa and the Companion are sent to Mississippi to raise money for moving west. And several of those saints become lifelong friends of Amasa's. One of several John Browns, Amy Brown Lyman's dad, who founds Alpine up by Pleasant Grove and is the bishop there, has a brother-in-law, William Crosby, whom Amasa chooses as a bishop at least twice. Did you know Amasa founded the second settlement in Utah? The southeast corner of Great Salt Lake Valley, where Big and Little Cottonwood Canyon come out of the mountains, and Draper, he called all three of those bishops. It was called Amos's Survey. Why didn't he ever get any recognition for that? Because he's a damned apostate. He was erased out of the church history there. Did you know that? He still is. He still is. Yeah. He won't be. He won't be? I hope you're right. We're going to put an end to it, this export. Okay. How many of you knew that he founded the second town in Utah? I don't know anything that Lyman Platt doesn't know. Although we <laughs> argue a little bit on Amos's wives. Well, you come to my lecture. I'm going to. I'll argue with you there. No, you won't. <laughs> I believe we're out of time, aren't we? Yeah, I think so. I, I apologize. I'm embarrassed that I can't read the fine print quick enough. It's not the way I was told six months ago, and I didn't follow this carefully enough. You know I'm a Luddite, and I don't get into family web pages near enough. That's my excuse. Thank you.